Hello everybody and welcome to a very special episode of Science. Today I'm going to go a little bit into what can essentially be called the darker side of science and that is specifically talking a bit about scientific misconduct. Uh, so we're talking about things like falsifying data, uh, lying to journals, just in general doing science improperly regardless of how it is. And as much as it pains uh, to admit it, it does happen and it is very unfortunate for the entire field when not only it occurs but especially when it's found out obviously. It's happened uh, several times in the relatively recent past. Uh, one of the notable cases was in uh, Korea where a group claimed that they were able to clone humans or uh, clone the humans for the purpose of making uh, what are called embryonic stem cells. And uh, it turns out that uh, all of the data was falsified, which is very, very unfortunate. Today, I'm going to be talking about one a, a case of scientific misconduct that was relatively recent. It happened in January of this year, 2014, and uh, essentially it grew to such an obnoxious scale that it was almost unbelievable. Uh, how far and how deep uh, the scandal went, really. It's, it's really shocking. And uh, it's one of the things where a lot of times uh, most scientific stories generally do not get picked up by media uh, simply because a lot of the public at large don't really care much for science. But if science screws up in some way, then a lot of people will hear about it and it's very, very unfortunate. Uh, essentially there's one of two ways that you can be a scientist in the media. Uh, you either did something amazing or you did something terrible. And it's sort of two sides of the same coin, uh, which is very unfortunate again. But uh, as for the actual topic that I will be t discussing, I'll be uh, talking about what are called the Stimulus Triggered Acquisition of Pluripotency, or STEP cells for short. And uh, these were uh, derived in Japan at what is called the Riken or Riken Institute, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And uh, basically, after all of the, the scandal broke and after everything sort of calmed down, all of the nastiness wash, washed away and all of this kind of stuff, the entire institute is under scrutiny by not only the Japanese government, but also international entities as well. Uh, but uh, that's for a little bit later on in this particular video. For now, I'm going to start off by uh, just briefly discussing some of the cell types that I'll be talking about and uh, how they're important and uh, how they relate to development and things of that nature. So on a most basic level, I'll be talking a decent amount about uh, some cell and molecular biology during this video. And uh, for, uh, for this particular section, I'll talk a lot about uh, basically the acronyms and uh, what the cell types mean and all of this kind of stuff. Uh, for the most part, I'm going to stick to the actual controversy. Uh, because, you know, controversy in any language is still controversial, uh, so it won't make that much of a difference, essentially. But uh, for the purposes of right now, uh, I'm, I'm going to stick uh, with uh, at least a very basic general idea of the uh, most of the science behind this. Uh, starting off, I'm going to discuss very briefly embryonic stem cells, or ES cells. I'm sure that uh, many of you, or the vast majority of you, have heard of ES cells in some form or another, and uh, particularly in uh, their potential capacity for therapeutic purposes. So you're talking about essentially making new blood for somebody, making a new liver, making a new pancreas, all of this kind of stuff. Absolutely incredible. And uh, essentially, the stem cells themselves uh, start off in uh, what's called the ICM, or the inner cell mass of an embryo as it's growing. 
and uh, this is the actual part of the embryo that's going to end up growing into the fetus. Uh, the stem cells themselves are capable into differentiating into the 200 odd cell types that make up, uh, in this case, a human uh, body. Uh, uh, important to note though is that embryonic stem cells do not contribute to things like the placenta or the yolk sac or uh, what are called the extra embryonic structures, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, essentially after you have these stem cells in culture in a lab, uh, then you can keep them in culture indefinitely. Uh, they, uh, if you uh, tell them to if you um, if you make them or uh, sometimes spontaneously they will undergo a process known as differentiation differentiation is very simply when an embryonic stem cell goes down what we call the hill into a differentiated state or an adult cell in other words uh, you have an embryonic cell go into something like a heart cell or a um, I don't know what else, uh, any other cell type, liver cell, kidney cell, blood cell, skin cell, whatever other cell type, that is known as differentiation. Okay, importantly, uh, the actual process of uh, differentiation gives us what we call a somatic cell. Somatic cells is just an, or a somatic cell is just another fancy way of saying an adult cell. A cell that is no longer what we call pluripotent, uh, by which I mean uh, it has the ability to go into all of those different uh, cell types there. Okay, uh, that, that is the basics of the embryonic stem cell. Now you may have heard of something like an adult stem cell, uh, such as a hematopoietic stem cell or a blood stem cell, uh, which is essentially a little bit farther down the differentiation scale. It doesn't have the ability to make absolutely everything, but it can make all of the blood types. So for example, a hematopoietic stem cell specifically uh, can make all the blood types, but it can't go and make a liver cell or things like that. All right, uh, adult stem cells, I won't really be talking about too much, but uh, those are another uh, potential therapeutic uh, device that's being examined as well. The other major uh, cell type and the uh, one really major development that the field has seen in uh, relatively recent times is uh, what is known as the induced pluripotent stem cell or IPS cell. This was first published by uh, Shinya Yamanaka back in 2006. And uh, essentially it's the process of literally taking an adult cell, in, in, the, uh, in the first case it was a skin cell from a mouse, and uh, several factors, uh, transcription factors, are forced to be expressed and it turns it back into a pluripotent cell or through a process that we call reprogramming. Uh, very simple. Okay, well it's not simple but that's the, the general process. And essentially what happens is you take uh, what was at one point a, a single cell that did a single function and you turn back the clock to a point where it behaves like an embryonic stem cell. In other words it can make all of those hundreds of different cell types just from a skin cell or a kidney cell or a liver cell or anything like that. This was an enormous breakthrough for the entire field and allowed for things like patient-specific therapies. It allows uh, us to potentially get around uh, problems like uh, immune rejection. It allows us to get around issues of um, morality in terms of um, the uh, religious right, uh, talking about uh, aborting fetuses for the purpose of stem cell research and things along those lines. Uh, induced pluripotent cells don't have any of those issues because you're going to an adult person and saying may we use your cells for this procedure okay so they give their consent they know what's happening and you can then do it it's a wonderful wonderful procedure that has great potential for many many different things right the entire process itself is also, uh, it's, it's not necessarily simple, but it's relatively quick once all of the pieces are in place. It takes right about a week to a week and a half or two weeks uh, to go from essentially a skin cell to uh, what we call a reprogrammed cell. Uh, uh, if you take those reprogrammed cells and you leave them in culture longer, they become more and more uh, what we call stem cell-like. 
but either way, you'll have something that resembles an embryonic stem cell within about two weeks. So a relatively fast process, which is great. And um, again, uh, the same potential as far as therapeutics are concerned for embryonic stem cells, but a lot less controversy and potentially better results because they can be from a specific patient that ha who has a specific disease. And in addition to that, um, the actual uh, discovery or the, uh, the first use of the induced pluripotent stem cells uh, by Dr. Yamanaka uh, was also represented as one of the fastest turnarounds uh, for getting a Nobel Prize. Uh, he got it uh, relatively recently, I don't remember exactly when, but he shared it with another uh, very famous professor named John Gurdon, uh, who was uh, famous in, I believe, the 60s or the 70s for cloning frogs. Uh, that's, that was his really big claim to fame. And essentially, they, they both demonstrated this process of reprogramming. That's really what this is about. It's about reprogramming, getting these cells back into a state similar to these embryonic cells. That's really what this is all about. And that's what's very important with the STAP cells as a new mechanism for this, or a supposedly new mechanism for this. And so with that, I'm going to uh, go right on ahead and dive into the papers themselves. Uh, not the data just yet, but just uh, the actual papers, uh, where they were from, who wrote them, all of those kinds of things. So the papers regarding STAP cells themselves were both published in the journal Nature on January 29th of uh, 2014. And uh, these are the, uh, the two uh, covers uh, for the papers. So uh, the first paper is the stimulus triggered fate conversion of somatic cells to pluripotency. I know, don't worry about it. That's just the name of the paper, okay? Essentially, this is the paper that documents how the STAP cells were made, all right? It, it shows the, the methodology and it shows the data showing uh, whether or not the cells were actually what the authors claimed they were. The second paper is called Bidirectional Developmental Potential in Reprogrammed Cells with Acquired Pluripotency. I know, it's really, really boring. Don't worry, I'm not gonna go really far into these, all right? This particular paper, the second one, the one I just read off, uh, discusses what the cells are capable of uh, in comparison to embryonic stem cells. Uh, but like I said, I'm not gonna go too in-depth into the science. I'm mostly only going to discuss the primary aspects uh, in terms of how they relate to the controversy that ended up coming up later, okay? So uh, with that, uh, there were a couple of authors of note on both of these papers. First and most importantly is Haruko Obakata. Uh, Dr. Obakata is the first author on both papers, and at the time she was a postdoctoral fellow at uh, the Riken Institute. I'm going to call it Riken. It might be Riken depending on what country you're from, but I'm going to call it the Riken Institute. All right. Uh, the second major person is Teruhiku Wakayama. Uh, Dr. Wakayama is famous in this particular field because he was the first person to successfully clone mice, which was a huge deal and still is to this day. We still use clone mice all over cellular and molecular biology. Uh, the third person that I want to mention is Charles Vacanti. Charles Vacanti is a uh, professor at Harvard who is most famous for uh, the first um, growth of a human appendage uh, using a mouse model, right there. It is known as the Vacanti mouse and it indeed was the mouse that had an ear growing on its back. It was an enormous breakthrough in stem cell technology as well as uh, essentially xenografts. Uh, in other words, taking a, uh, cells from one species and putting them on another and having them grow. All right, this was a very unique thing and it actually generated a functional ear, although obviously it was just the external portion, it wasn't the internal uh, part of the ear. That is neither here nor there. The important thing is he's on the papers as one of the authors, okay? And 
so those are the the three main people that I will be uh, talking about and I'll keep mentioning them throughout uh, my video here uh, to remind you of who they are what they did all that kind of stuff all right but now I'm going to delve into the science behind the stap cell For the scientific portion of this video, as I've mentioned several times now, I'm going to keep it as light as I can uh, to keep it as understandable as possible. Uh, but I will be showing uh, like images from uh, directly from the papers and things like that uh, to get my point across and uh, also to uh, show you what I'm talking about. But don't worry, you don't have to understand what the data is showing. Just be aware of this is what the data looks like. All right, that's essentially the, the first step. So uh, for the, the first paper that actually discusses the stap cells themselves, um, they show an extremely simple method for getting a pluripotent cell that takes a half hour. A half hour. Now, if you recall, Induced pluripotent stem cells, or IPS cells, are made in approximately two weeks. This reprogramming takes a half hour and then about a week in culture to fully reprogram. This is an incredible feat. And not only that, but it's extremely simple. All right? You can see here that very simply you take cells, uh, adult cells, in this case from the spleen, uh, which are blood cells, they, uh, they use white blood cells for this, and then uh, they were exposed to uh, a low pH. In other words, they were put in acid, a very mild acid. They literally sat there for about 25 minutes and then uh, they were put into another tube, spun down, centrifuged, and then they were plated. Seven days later, boom, you've got pluripotent cells. That's it. That is an extremely simple way to get something ridiculously complicated. Initially, uh, Dr. Obakota, uh, the, the lead author on these papers, said that she, was, she first noticed this phenomenon through essentially what's called mechanical stress. In other words, she was putting uh, these uh, lymphocytes, these white blood cells, through a capillary tube, a really, really skinny tube. And when she did that, she noticed that she got some of these cells that looked like embryonic stem cells and that's sort of where uh, the whole thing took off for her and they found that uh, and that's why the um, the stamp cell is stimulus triggered acquisition of pluripotency the stimulus is essentially mechanical uh, by the the capillary uh, chemical the pH which is the one that was published or physical that is uh, just increase or decrease the heat uh, just somehow stress the cells and they'll undergo this process okay uh, so very briefly, like I said, they, they used uh, white blood cells from the spleen. I'll explain why they use those cells specifically. Uh, but uh, the white blood cells uh, were, uh, it was from what's called a transgenic mouse, which means that it has a gene that's normally not part of it. And this particular gene made the cells turn green if they expressed a specific gene called OCT4. OCT4 is what's known as a pluripotency factor that is expressed in things like embryonic cells, embryonic stem cells, and induced pluripotent stem cells. In other words, if you have one of those cells that can differentiate into all those cell types, it will be expressing OCT4. In other words, this was the way that they would show that they indeed got back to that pluripotent state if the cells turn green. So this is one of the images from one of the papers, and you can see, uh, particularly at the high magnification, that you have essentially a green blob. And that green blob shows them, hey, look, we're expressing this gene. That means that we have pluripotent cells, right? Uh, the, the other aspect to this figure, the, uh, the one that's on the, the right side there, is what's called FACS sorting, F-A-C-S. That is fluorescence activated cell sorting. And essentially what that means is the, uh, the cells are, are sent through a machine and a laser shoots, the, machine, shoots the, uh, the cells there. And if the machine detects a fluorescence, in this case green, then the cells will be sorted into one pile. That's essentially all it is, okay? Um, the, uh, the next figure here, uh, that you can see is essentially just a time course of, uh, you can see in the, the bar graph is a time course of uh, the number of cells that had that OCT4 GFP, the, the green cells, increased 
over the course of a week. That's what the, uh, the little green bar there is. It essentially says, look, we got more green cells over time. Okay, same thing in the image, you can pretty clearly see it, right? Next is the importance of why they used white blood cells, okay? White blood cells, the, uh, the specific type they used are called uh, B cells, plasma cells. And these undergo uh, what are, or uh, not, not B cells, these are the, uh, the CD45 positive cells. It's a slightly different one, okay? The, the reason they use these cells is during differentiation in a, in a body, when they're in the bone marrow, they undergo a process known as VDG, VDJ sorry, recombination. VDJ recombination essentially makes the cell only have a specific function. It has a very specific antibody that it makes uh, in order to, or uh, a specific way that it expresses a certain gene so that it can react to a specific um, what's it called? Uh, insult, uh, something like an infection or things like that. And essentially, uh, what this uh, gel shows, this is a, uh, an example of gel electrophoresis. Essentially, the individual white bands represent DNA strands, okay, of, uh, of different sizes. The smaller strands are at the bottom and the larger strands are at the top, okay? So you can see in the embryonic stem cells and the fibroblasts, the ES and the fibroblasts, those, uh, those first two columns there, you just have the one single band on the top, right? And in the next one, the lymphocytes, that is what's called the positive control. Those are the cells from which the stap cells were made. And you can see there's a very distinct banding pattern. You can see there are some fragments and then there's one at the bottom, all right? And essentially what that's gonna tell the authors is if this is correct, then the cells that go from being lymphocytes back to these green cells that are expressing this specific gene are going to have that same banding pattern. Okay, it's actually a, a really cool system and a great way uh, to tell what happens. And essentially you can see that they do indeed have that pattern. Okay, easy enough, right? I know that was a lot of explanation for not a whole lot of anything. Okay, next is um, a quick crash course in gene expression. So you can see here we've got a bar graph and then a bunch of black and white dots. Uh, the bar graph is uh, a measurement of the gene expression of these specific genes, right? So all of the genes listed there are specific for the pluripotent state. And you can see at the ES cell side, uh, they're all expressed, they all have values of some sort. And then the opt for GFP positive, the green cells that uh, the stab cells are turning into also have those markers. Great, excellent, that's what we wanna see, right? That means that they are similar to embryonic stem cells. Easy enough, okay? So then, at the bottom, all those green and black, or not green dots, but the black and white dots, that is what we call a bisulfite assay and it determines what's called methylation of the DNA. I know, don't worry, you don't have to know what it is. Essentially, again, just compare what the ES looks like compared to the GFP positive, okay? You can see clearly that the ES one is mostly white dots and the OC4 GFP positive is mostly white dots. That's all that you need to know. They're similar and it means that those genes are being expressed, the ones that they were testing, okay? Uh, again, I'm, I'm sorry that I know I'm getting a, a bit into the science with all this, but I'm, I'm trying not to, okay? It's, um, it is a lot to take in, I understand. But uh, don't worry, we're, pr we're pretty close to done here. Um, next, the, uh, the major thing for the initial paper was the, uh, the, these images right here that essentially show, look, these cells can make all these different germ layers. Uh, if you've taken developmental biology or uh, know about embryonic development, then you may have heard the terms um, the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. Those are what are called the three germ layers. And the ectoderm is outside, okay? That's what ecto means. And essentially that's stuff like uh, skin, the brain, the spinal cord, that all comes from the ectoderm. The mesoderm or middle derm is, um, 
a lot of things like uh, skeletal muscles, bones, things of that nature, and then the endoderm are uh, a lot of the organs, like the abdominal organs, heart, lungs, liver, things like that. Okay, essentially this is just showing, look, we have these markers, and we see that these cells are making these three germ layers. Easy enough, right? That's all that uh, both of those figures mean, it's just two different ways of showing the exact same thing. But I just want you to remember, remember these pictures. Remember what they look like. They're coming back later. Okay? So, after that, we, uh, we get to the second paper, the bidirectional development. And if you remember, I mentioned at the very beginning that embryonic stem cells, or pluripotent cells in general, cannot make the placenta or the yolk sac. They cannot make these extra embryonic materials, only the materials that are in the embryo itself. That's all that they can make. Okay? So if you look at this image here, then you can see at the top, that is what is called the ES chimera. A chimera, uh, based on the mythological creature, the chimera, is literally exactly that. It's an amalgamation of uh, two or more sources of cells. In this case, they used embryonic stem cells and stuck them into a developing embryo, and then they used uh, the stap cells and stuck them into a developing embryo. And what they're trying to show with this particular image is in these stap cells, you can see the placenta and the yolk sac slightly lighting up with that uh, this uh, GFP marker, this green fluorescent protein marker, uh, indicating that the cells are there. There. And you can see in the, em the embryonic stem cell one, you don't see any outline of a placenta or yolk sac or anything along those lines. Okay? Uh, next, we got a bunch of bar graphs. These bar graphs essentially show exactly what I just told you, right? It shows that uh, these stap cells that were generated uh, were able to make these extra embryonic structures, the yolk sac and the placenta and all those kinds of things. That's all that they're showing. Okay? Easy enough, right? So. Uh, just to very briefly summarize the science behind all of this, uh, starting at about three days post-exposure to uh, the acid, in this case, the uh, stap cells began to express these pluripotency factors. They started to, to get that green tinge from the green fluorescent pl protein. The uh, stap cells were also derived from numerous tissue types. Uh, only a couple were actually in the publication, but the author claimed she did it from pretty much every cell type that she could think of. And uh, the cells were used to generate what are called uh, teratomas, as well as the chimeric mice. And uh, the teratomas are essentially where you take uh, embryonic stem cells or any sort of pluripotent cell, you stick it into an animal, preferably a nude mouse, and then it makes uh, what is, what's similar to a tumor that has all three germ layers. It just means that, look, you can make all three germ layers. That's a teratoma, okay? And, uh, you, and they were also capable of reproducing and what's called tetraploid complementation. So reproducing, obvious enough, the mice could get down with it and have babies, right? Very, very important for something like this. If you can't make babies, then there's kind of a problem with it. Tetraploid complementation is, it's essentially a, a very fancy way of uh, forcing a type of uh, reproduction, okay? And I'll leave it at that. If you really want, you can look it up later or you can ask about it and I'll go more into, into depth with it, okay? In addition, the stap cells could also be maintained in culture, just like embryonic stem cells as well as the induced pluripotent stem cells that came before them. So all in all, decent data. They had good data that showed what they were trying to show, or at least it seemed to, right? And this is a major, major scientific breakthrough. The problem with a major, major scientific breakthrough is the first thing that you're gonna have to deal with is scrutiny. So right now, I'm going to get into the real meat of what's going on in this video, and that is all of the controversy surrounding the stap cells. So moving right along into what I really want to talk about here is the controversy that eventually arose uh, regarding the stap cells and the procedure uh, regarding making them. So as I mentioned at the very beginning, these papers were first published on January 29th of 2014. On February 17th, so basically two and a half weeks later, 
Nature News published a story that mentioned several issues, not only with the uh, the two stap cell papers, but also with several papers from 2011 uh, that were uh, written by Obakota as well. And uh, the 2000 study uh, essentially duplicated gel images. So you remember gel images. Uh, essentially what she did is she took a slice of those gels digitally, flipped it around, and said that it was something else. Big no-no. Uh, it was claimed that it had nothing to, that uh, it was just a mix-up of the panels and it didn't affect the data, the conclusions, or any component, blah, blah, blah. And uh, incidentally, that's a quote by Charles Vincanti, if you remember, our mouse, our mouse friend, and one of the authors from uh, these recent papers, okay? So those are from 2011 though. Let's get into the 2014, right? Initially, there are several major problems. First were issues with several images, right? The first one being the image with this placenta, right? So if you remember, the uh, the top image is uh, from the, the first thing that I showed you where it was the chimeric image of the stap cells. The bottom image is from another figure from the same paper that claimed to be a different experiment. The problem is that the actual placenta image, the actual placental part of that, was just cut off and rotated. And that is what is the bottom image is. So that was a pretty big issue. Uh, the second image issue uh, was this one right here. And essentially uh, what was claimed about this was nothing that was really too terrible. Uh, it just said that it's too pixelated. And okay, I mean, it certainly is pixelated, but the idea was you can't tell if that green signal is actually within the cells. That was the argument that was made, all right? Uh, one of the biggest ones, and uh, also one of my personal favorites, is this our gel image. If you remember, uh, this was the positive control that actually shows that these stack cells are what the author said they were. Here's the problem. Even a most basic, rudimentary brightness and contrast adjustment to this image shows us very clearly that the center lane is spliced. The center lane is from a different gel altogether. And essentially what happened was the center lane was cut out and replaced with the center lane or whatever lane from another gel image. That is a huge no-no. You cannot do that. The author, uh, Obakota, just claimed like, oh, I didn't know I was just trying to make a good image, yada, yada, yada. No. If you want to take it a step further, go with some false color imaging, and the contrast is even more blatant. You can clearly see that that center image, that center lane, is from a completely different thing. You can see very distinct borders on it, which is a very shocking thing that I'll talk about uh, later on at the very end of this video. Next is my personal favorite. My personal favorite part of the images are the issues that uh, we had with, with the images. Uh, so uh, to start off with, take a look at this image. If you remember, uh, this was one of the images that Obakota was saying, look, this shows that our stap cells can make, uh, in this case, uh, muscle. This is a smooth muscle stain, okay? It uses actin, which is the, uh, the muscle fiber, essentially, right? Great. Now, take a look at this picture. Does it look relatively similar? Relatively familiar? Kinda does, right? It looks really similar, actually. Now, take a look at all three. So, at the top here, we have the three images from the Nature paper, and on the bottom are three images that look remarkably similar. The bottom images are straight from Dr. Obakota's doctoral thesis. In other words, these are not only from a different experiment, they are not only from a different lab, they are not only from a different cell type, they are from a different species, even. 
Her doctoral work was done on human cells, and she's claiming that these are images of mouse cells. How do you even begin to defend that kind of a mix-up? It's absolutely ridiculous. But don't worry, I'm going to get a lot more into her thesis in just a couple of minutes. Essentially, um, one of the other issues uh, was plagiarism. So we, we had the, uh, the issues with the images of various sorts and varying degrees of severity, but then there was plagiarism where uh, large sections of the methods that were described in the two papers were not only wrong, but they were directly copied from other papers. And not even other papers by the same authors, but other papers by different groups, different authors, and they weren't cited. That is another big no-no. You can't copy things from other people. If you do, you at least have to say, we did this same thing, see this paper. At the very, very least, okay? But the worst part is that some of these were just downright wrong, which is just awful, okay? By far, though, the biggest issue, again, this is within two and a half weeks of the papers being published. By far, the biggest issue was reproducibility. Nobody could get this to work. It's so simple. All you do, you take the cells, put them in acid for 25 minutes, and then boom, a week later, you're done. That's it. No other lab could do it. According to Nature News, the article that was published, um, they they had responses from 10, quote, prominent stem cell laboratories. And none of those laboratories could reproduce this procedure. And again, this is two and a half weeks later, so maybe there's a bit of weirdness, you know, there, there's always uh, some things that, you know, it seems like it should work perfectly, but it never does, okay? Maybe. Um, Part of the issue was uh, Dr. Wakayama, the, uh, the cloning specialist, he was able to reproduce the procedure, but he was heavily coached by uh, Dr. Obakota, uh, essentially uh, just about with uh, her standing over his shoulder. And uh, before the papers were published, he actually left the Riken Institute, and since getting into his new, uh, new lab, he has not been able to reproduce this procedure, which is very interesting. So the immediate consequence for this was Riken started an internal investigation on uh, several of these key points. The, uh, the first one being the issues with the images, so the pixelation, the splicing, and uh, the copying from you know, the thesis. And, um, and then looking at the incorrect procedures for several of the methodologies, as well as um, just the, the fact that they were plagiarized without any sort of citations, okay? So relatively soon after that, on the, uh, the 5th of March, so about another three weeks or, or so, uh, there was a quote that I, that I wrote down for this. Uh, Despite its seeming simplicity, this procedure requires special care. That's a quote from Dr. Obakota, who uh, essentially published a 10-page instructional, man instructional manual for making these cells that had what she called important nuances. Now, if you ask me by definition, a nuance is exactly that. It shouldn't matter. It's a nuance, but whatever. There are about 30 or so giant exclamation marks saying, look, do this, make certain you do this. If you don't do this, it's not going to work. It's, it's pretty ludicrous. Okay. But even after that, there's still nobody who has successfully done this. It's it's just ludicrous, okay? Uh, a few days later, on March 10th, uh, Dr. Wakayama told the Japanese media, quote, I'm no longer sure the articles are correct. So this is the first instance, at least publicly, that I was able to find that one of the authors came forward and straight up said, we might be wrong here. We're not certain we might be wrong, but we got to keep going. And uh, he actually asked, that these studies be pulled and they wait for some kind of third-party independent validation. Uh, at this time, though, Charles Vincanti is still standing by uh, the data and saying, yes, STAP is a real phenomenon and that it actually happened. And of course, Dr. Obakota this entire time is saying the exact same thing. Okay. So March 14th brought on the Riken Institute's initial report 
of what had happened. And they determined uh, basically two instances of what they called, quote, inappropriate behavior, but not enough to warrant a accusation or a, um, a conviction of misconduct. And essentially, they said that the pixelated images were the result of the process to prepare them. And the placenta pictures were determined uh, to be duplicates indeed. But they accepted the explanation that one was supposed to be deleted before it was accepted. In other words, it was a placeholder image. Now, I don't know about you, but I know if I've got a placeholder image, I'm going to have a blank picture the exact size of what I need with something like a big X through it. Something that is obviously a placeholder so I don't actually send it to one of the most prestigious journals in the world. But hey, that's just me. Who knows? You know, whatever. Immediately after this, there were several uh, relatively big consequences. Uh, first, the, uh, the director of uh, Riken Center for Developmental Biology, or the CDB, uh, who is uh, Masatoshi uh, Takaichi, uh, he requested the withdrawal of the main paper. And uh, the authors who were at Riken, which is a, a large portion of them, uh, initially agreed, but then later said that they were only, quote, considering a retraction. And Vacanti still said, nope, not going to happen. Now, here's the thing about a uh, retraction of a scientific paper. Um, what essentially has to happen is all of the authors have to agree that this paper needs to be retracted or else it's not going to happen. In addition, the journal in which it was published needs to say, okay, we agree with you. This doesn't make sense. We're going to retract it. Ultimately, the journal has the final say in what actually occurs, right? And in this case, uh, the majority of the authors are essentially like, oh, yeah, this is probably something that needs to be taken off. And then they got a little wishy-washy, but uh, Vacanti is always saying, nope, not going to happen. It's still good. We're fine. Okay? And so now uh, I'm just going to uh, take a, a break for the uh, purposes of uh, the menu here and before I go on to even more issues with plagiarism and uh, this particular part being from uh, Dr. Obakota's doctoral thesis. Right now I'm going to continue on with uh, some of the more blatant uh, parts of plagiarism that uh, Dr. Obakota had, in this case with her doctoral thesis. And I had mentioned earlier that this scandal and this misconduct goes very, very deep, surprisingly deep actually, and this is what I was referring to, where it started off with two papers that looked a little bit suspicious, moved into more papers by the same author, and then subsequently into her doctoral thesis. Uh, where not only were their images duplicated, but now something that I would argue is almost worse, okay? So uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to uh, put images uh, from, uh, from what I'm reading, and I'm just going to read this directly off of what it was. So this is a quote from her thesis. This is the first paragraph of Dr. Obakota's thesis. Stem cells have the remarkable potential to develop into many different cell types in the body during early life and growth. In addition, in many tissues, they serve as a sort of internal repair system, dividing essentially without limit to replenish other cells as long as the person or animal is still alive. Uh, when a stem cell divides, each new cell has the potential either to remain a stem cell or become another type of cell with a more specialized function, such as a muscle cell, red blood cell, or brain cell. Okay, easy enough, concise, good, nice information, right? Uh, so I'm going to read this to you now. Uh, this is from a different source, and it says, uh, what are stem cells and why are they important? Stem cells have the remarkable ability or the remarkable potential to develop into many different cell types in the body during early life and growth. In addition, in many tissues, they serve as this sort of internal repair sy system, dividing essentially without limit to replenish other cells as long as the person or animal is still alive. When a stem cell divides, yada, 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 you get the idea. Here's the problem. The paragraphs that I just read, read are not only identical to one another, but they are taken directly from the NIH's website, the National Institutes of Health, um, the, which is the, the portion of the U.S. government that gives funding to scientific research or the vast majority of scientific research. Um, 
And normally that wouldn't really be an issue because you can cite a source. In the first 20 pages of her doctoral thesis, the entire text was copied not only directly from the NIH's website, but without a single source cited. 20 pages. That is just ludicrous. There is no way that you can get out of that. I'm trying to write papers that are 20 pages long, like the entire thing. And I have 80 references and she's got 20 pages and no references. You would think that would send up a red flag to her committee, right? Well, unfortunately not. Charles Vincanti, a member of Dr. Obakota's doctoral uh, studies committee or a doctoral committee who approved her thesis was quoted as saying, I was not presented with nor asked to read a copy of her dissertation. So let's think about that for a second. He just said that he approved her to graduate to receive a doctoral degree. And not only did he not read the information that she was presenting, but he wasn't even asked to read it. He didn't even get a copy of it. And to me, that sounds a little bit crazy. Um, Dr. Obakota herself uh, claimed in, a, uh, in a, um, a quote from a March 20th article in Nature that she intended to uh, withdraw the, her dissertation, but uh, at the time had not sent any formal request to do so, and uh, still, as of yet, has not done that. Uh, in addition to all of those issues, still, as of March 21st, nobody has been able to reproduce this method, even with this giant 10-page PDF paper showing every single thing that you need to know about stap cells and how to make them, nobody can still do it. And uh, Vincanti is the only one who had claimed to be able to do it, uh, but he didn't show any data to prove it. Uh, Dr. Wakayama had tried without success, and unfortunately, all of the other authors on both of the papers had not even attempted it until all of this controversy arose. And it makes you think, at least initially, why is that? Why is it that these high-profile authors are not testing these things that they have their name on? The obvious answer is simply, well, if you're an author on a paper, you have to trust the people who are doing the work. You can't assume that these people are doing the, the research wrong. And that's perfectly reasonable, but at the same time, if you have something that is as groundbreaking as a stap cell that takes a half hour to make and then seven days to get what you need, you'd think that one other person would be like, that's really cool. We should probably do that. And it makes no sense that nobody did. But maybe that's just me. I don't know. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that ended up being one of the final nails in the coffin for all this was uh, the cell lines actually turned out to be incorrect. They were from the wrong mice, for lack of a better term. And I won't go into all the details of which mice were what and all that kind of thing. Suffice it to say that essentially several of the lines that were tested uh, by uh, Dr. Wakayama, the cloning expert, uh, he said that the cell lines that were not published were from the wrong type of mouse, which is very, very strange. It doesn't mean anything because the ones that were published were correct. The ones that were published were from the right cells, but Dr. Obakota claimed that she had made these stamp cells over 200 times from all these different mice, uh, all of which were sent by uh, Dr. Wakayama, and she was able to do it every single time without fail, and when she sent them back to him for genetic testing, the test came back as different cell lines than what she claimed. Very, very, very strange. Okay? 
Uh, and the most likely cause of this is actually embryonic stem cell contamination. In other words, you have uh, the, the plates that have stap cells in them, and somehow or another, uh, they ended up getting embryonic cells in there, so they behave as if they're embryonic cells when they're actually not. Okay, That's the most likely cause for something like that, and which would essentially ruin the stap cell itself. Okay. Uh, moving right along, uh, the, the next thing was on April 1st, uh, back to uh, the Riken Committee, uh, Dr. Obakota was found guilty of research misconduct on the basis of splicing the gel image and reusing the images from her thesis. Okay, And uh, her responses were as follows. <clears throat> For the gel, I wanted to make a better image. It did not change the data. Her response to using her thesis images. It was, quote, a simple mistake, as the images were similar. <sighs> so, if you want to make a new gel, make a new gel. Don't cheat and splice. That's not cool. And make sure you use the right images. Why is it that you have images from your thesis, which was written in 2011, next to the images that you made in 2014? Why is that? Tell, tell me what kind of organizational system has that in place? Because I certainly am not aware of one. I hope that somebody is. But that was on April 1st uh, that that happened. And in addition to that, the, the committee found several other major issues with the lab uh, just as a whole. They, amongst many other things, they had poor data management, they had inadequate labeling of their samples, and they had terrible, terrible record keeping uh, amongst, like I said, many other things. And um, Shinsuke uh, Ishii, who is uh, the chair of the committee, uh, was stated that it was impossible to tell what happened, when it happened, and by whom the work was done which is terrible for any scientific process, anything, not to mention something that's supposedly so groundbreaking. It's just ludicrous. Not labeling your samples? What? Why would you not do that? Not maintaining a lab notebook showing what you did, when you did it, and how it happened? That is Science 101. This is ridiculous. Like I said, this thing goes deeper than anybody ever thought that it possibly could. It makes no sense. How are these people getting away with this? It's so, so crazy. It's, been, it's clearly been going on for a while. I'm sure that she's not the first person in that lab who couldn't label her samples. It's just insane. So naturally, after the decision on April 1st by the committee, uh, Obakota, uh, appealed the decision and attributed the problems to her, quote, immaturity and lack of training. Labeling samples is not a lack of training. If you are a high school student in a lab, you learn how to label samples. If you have a doctoral degree, you better know how to label a sample. It makes no sense. That, ugh. I just, I don't even know anymore. I don't even know. It makes no sense. That's it. Okay? So, from that, the Riken Institute, the, uh, the committee, had an additional 50 days from the 1st of April to make a final decision and essentially determine whether or not they were going to accept Dr. Obakota's appeal. So, I'm going to take another uh, short break for the purposes of the menu, and I'm going to go on uh, not only into the final decision, but also into essentially the end part of the story, as well as more about the committee. So to wrap up essentially all the controversy that happened and the final decision by the Riken Committee, uh, I wanted to start off first by saying that there was a little bit of irony uh, within the committee itself. Um, essentially there are six people on the Ethics Committee that uh, the Riken uh, Institute started up and it was revealed that four of them were being scrutinized for their own research after a lot of this surfaced. And in response to that, the Riken told all 
280 of its investigators to examine all of their previous work to figure out what was going on and if anything else like this was going to happen. So just imagine right now or just picture for me, we started off with two papers that look a little bit strange. We move on to complete and utter plagiarism, uh, reuse of images that are completely inappropriate, uh, essentially uh, nearly losing a doctorate degree uh, because of plagiarism within a thesis, scrutinization of the ethics committee within the institute and subsequently the entire institute giving itself an audit. How much deeper can you get than <laughs> going from a single person making a mistake to the entire institute she works for scrutinizing every single one of its employees? That is just insane. It's, I mean, in a way, it's just downright impressive how far this goes. It's, it's just insane. Oh, regardless, in um, uh, uh, underneath the uh, the fifty day uh, cutoff on May 9th, the Riken Ethics Committee announced that Obokota's appeal was not accepted, and she was indeed convicted of uh, research misconduct, and uh, the Riken Institute officially requested that uh, all of the authors withdraw uh, both papers uh, from Nature. Um, and the problem with all this is it still doesn't really answer the fundamental question of, like, yes, this is presented poorly in these papers, but that doesn't mean that STAP itself is not real, the actual phenomenon for it. Uh, so one thing that happened is uh, Dr. Wakayama sent eight STAP cell lines for additional independent genetic testing uh, to, ex to further examine the possibility that they were contaminated by the embryonic stem cell lines, which I had mentioned earlier. And uh, Hitoshi Niwa, uh, who was one of the co-authors, is uh, attempting a replication based on Obakota's protocol. Uh, she is uh, basically going to be there and helping out and all that kind of stuff, okay? But not really, because in a very recent development, we have a new article here that I printed out that was published on the 17th of June. And um, and furthermore, on um, various uh, various other dates and times uh, for different reasons, um, <laughs> the cells are essentially not what they claim to be. If you remember, before I mentioned that Dr. Wakayama tested several cell lines uh, and and determined that they were not from the same mice. Uh, they were from uh, different mice than what uh, Dr. Obakota said that they were from. And in this case. Uh, while the cell lines, the STAP cell lines, were the correct mouse type, they were the, uh, the correct hybrid mouse, the problem is that the very important gene, that green gene, the green fluorescent protein, uh, was in the wrong spot for the mouse or the mice that she was given to do this and supposedly did these experiments with. So let me put that another way. She was given one mouse and said, here, do the experiments. And then she does the experiments and it turns out it's from this mouse instead. That is a really big problem because she said, yeah, I use this mouse. This is the one I use. It's the one you sent me. But the data shows that those cells are from a completely different mouse type one that isn't even used in Dr. Wakayama's lab. So where did it come from? Who knows? What this does is it seriously, seriously supports the idea of ESL contamination. And because of that, the authors, all of the authors, including Dr. Vicante, said that uh, they, they all agreed to retract the two papers in light of uh, this new evidence. And 
essentially it all just came crashing down and it was just really really bad the problem is again still you can't say that for sure this never happened but it's getting much much harder to claim that it actually did and the problem is it's on obakota's shoulders to prove that she actually made this work and so far none of the evidence supports her nobody as of yet still has been able to do this and um one thing that's uh, that's important to note let me get my uh, my little notes over here uh, one one thing that's important to note is uh, again it doesn't necessarily mean that there is no scientific merit and uh, one thing uh, that had similar really tough runs was Dolly the sheep after Dolly was cloned it was almost a year before the procedure was done again successfully at least it was done plenty of times unsuccessfully right and uh, in addition human embryonic stem cells uh, that were essentially made where you literally take an egg, take a sperm, fertilize the egg, and then you get the, actually no, it was from a, from a different method. I apologize. Uh, this was from a, a process called SCNT, which is somatic cell nuclear transfer, which is how Dolly was made. Essentially what you do is you take an adult cell, take its nucleus out, its DNA, take the DNA out, and then you stick it into an egg that has no DNA and then the nucleus gets reprogrammed and you get a, an embryo, essentially. That's how uh, Dolly was generated. And uh, in 2013, the first time that it was shown definitively to have been done with a human. Uh, the human, of course, wasn't born. Uh, it was used to generate embryonic stem cells. And that was actually relatively recently done as well, okay? And that was uh, in... Um, uh, just a couple months ago, I believe it was um, late May of 2014 that that study was replicated. Okay, um, the induced pluripotent stem cells uh, were the same way. Where within about a year of publication, uh, there were more publications from other labs that were completely unrelated to the lab in which the work was initially done, who were publishing and and uh, getting papers out using the same techniques. STAP, I really don't see that happening. There are too many problems, nobody can do it, and with all of this controversy, all of the problems, all of the image issues, all of the plagiarism issues, the issues with the committee itself, everything that's going on, just huge, huge issues. In addition uh, to the, uh, the problems with the cells themselves, uh, these most recent articles also stated that the um, the CDB, the Center for Developmental Biology at the Riken Institute, is most likely going to be completely redone. It's going to get a different name, different staff, different everything because of this controversy. An entire branch of one of Japan's largest biotechnology companies is being brought down by essentially one person's mistakes and in my opinion lies i do not believe that stap cells are real personally uh i i really do not see the i i don't see the compelling evidence for it especially in light of uh the embryonic stem cell contamination potential uh from from these most recent articles so that being said, uh, that's it for the, the meat and potatoes, uh, so to speak, for the controversy. So now I'm just going to uh, go with a uh, brief summary and uh, just some of my personal thoughts regarding not only this particular case, but scientific misconduct in general. So that's it for my discussion on the stimulus-triggered acquisition of pluripotency controversy, uh, the cells, the people, the papers, and uh, essentially what everything that happened afterwards. I hope that you liked it, and I, I hope that it sort of opens your eyes a bit to uh, really the messy world that is scientific misconduct, and hopefully shows you just how seriously the field as a whole takes people who do bad science do it inappropriately do it wrong use the wrong things do the wrong thing all of that kind of stuff 
and I, I really hope that uh, it shows you just a, a little glimpse into some of what goes on and hopefully we won't be seeing much of it anymore. I, I know that we will at some point though. Uh, part of uh, the issue in general is the idea, especially in the US, of what's called publish or perish where if you don't get publications, then you're not going to get funding. If you don't get funding, you're not going to have a job. And the problem is so many people, especially new professors, are under so much pressure to get this kind of stuff done that some of them do support, or not support, but uh, turn to these types of methods where they make up data, they change things, they splice, they do all this crazy stuff just so that they can get published. But uh, as part of my summary, I really wanted to talk very briefly about uh, science as a whole and particularly with uh, peer review. Uh, because peer review is the process by which all of uh, scientific data gets published. Or uh, ge generally, I mean there are some journals that do very little or none. Uh, but essentially peer review, the idea is that you have several people who look at the paper you're trying to publish and say whether or not it's good enough to be publishable. Easy enough, right? The problem is, with something like this, and when something this big comes of it, with so many almost inane problems, how does it get past this scrutiny? For example, the, the gel image. How is it that one of the most prestigious journals on the entire planet can't be bothered to Photoshop images with just some basic, some really basic brightness and contrast to make sure that the images themselves have not been manipulated. It doesn't make sense. And uh, personally, I think that this is more of a window into what is not working because clearly the peer review here did not work. Obviously, the, the people reviewing the papers didn't have access to things like what, the, what mice were used, uh, being able to look at the lab and how it was organized. You know, uh, they, they didn't have access to her thesis, nor did they n have any reason to think that they should. But just basic things like with the methods and the plagiarism, how is it that they don't have some kind of ability to just, you know, I, I know that most college professors have uh, software that lets you put in uh, papers, uh, journals, you know, wh whatever it is that students are turning in, put it into a program and determine if X portion of it was plagiarized directly. And then you can say, okay, well, it's cited, so that's at least better. I, I, that is a most basic level. I mean, Photoshop even is, is a little bit higher, but at the same time, it's not that difficult and it would have shown at the very least that gel image issue. So it has me personally worried about the peer review process and um, at the very least probably the need for reviewers to uh, scrutinize a little bit more and really look more into this. Part of the thing obviously is that you know if you if you're a journal and you get one of these absolutely incredible like oh wow this is amazing this is a new technique it's going to revolutionize the field all of this kind of stuff then of course you're going to want to publish it and you and you might go in biased towards the idea that this is good we can publish this simply because it is a new thing and you at least hope that the people did their work uh, but uh, relatively recently it was revealed that the authors attempted numerous other journals uh, for as publication potential and were rejected from them. So that's something else to potentially think about, I guess. But again, it doesn't really help the main issue of how this got by. Granted, it does look good. The data looks good on its own, but on even a relatively minor scrutiny, you start to have a lot of problems. 
So with that, thank you very much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed my video on the uh, stap cells and the controversy surrounding them. And uh, I hope uh, really that, I know it was very technical, but that uh, you were able to really understand what I was saying, what I was getting at, especially regarding what happened and why it happened and why it was found, uh, as well as just sort of getting a glimpse behind the, uh, the so-called curtain or up in the ivory tower, however you want to put it, of the scientific field and in a way how it functions and most importantly how it deals with people that do things badly. And in this case, like I said, in my personal opinion, I do not believe that STAP is a real phenomenon. I think that the stimulus triggered acquisition of pluripotency is completely untrue. I believe that there was embryonic cell contamination, be it on purpose or by accident, doesn't matter, they were there. So in my personal opinion, I believe that STAP cells should be renamed to SCAM cells. But that's just me. So with that, thank you again very much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this, and if you want to see more videos like it, as well as videos on video games, board games, uh, top 5 and 10 lists, all sorts of crazy stuff like that, as well as scientific demonstrations and more ramblings on science itself, please subscribe, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments below. I'll be more than happy to answer anything uh, regarding not only the work that was done, but how it was done and all of that kind of stuff. And I've also put links in the description to the news articles uh, that came in after the publications, uh, or at least most of the news articles, um, so that you can read uh, more about it for yourself and the ramifications that occurred. Uh, but with that, like I said, uh, please uh, like and subscribe if you like what you see. And uh, until next time, I will see you later.